for welcome. I hope uh, my English is, is good enough. I was telling somebody this morning I have two languages, good English and bad English. <laughs> so I will try and stick to the good English. Right, the um, report, we're going, to, we're going to look at economics and business today. I'm going to have a few graphs, but all of it, I'll just get my report out of here, if it's open. <laughs> this is a report, always nice to show and tell. Uh, towards the circular economy, it was uh, just to correct Nicholas a little bit, it wasn't, uh, it was done on by our behalf by McKinsey, but not by their global institute, by the main consulting group, but that doesn't really make any difference. So uh, let's move on. We know we're in a lot of trouble. We're in a lot of trouble, I'm looking at the business case now. Here is the... Uh, up, un up until the year 2000, on average, the prices of commodities, this is a group of food, non-food, metals and energy, has been going down with about 1.2 to 1.6% a year. But all of that advantage, as business might see it, has been lost since the turn of the millennium. And uh, prices have um, gone up and have pretty much, despite being quite volatile, continued to rise. This makes it a little bit strange for some businesses who buy products, buy materials, make things and then let them be thrown away. Because the next time they're going to buy that raw material, they're going to be faced with rising prices, not falling prices. Which makes their position quite vulnerable in certain industries. We were talking to an automotive manufacturer who said last year our raw material prices went up 500 million euros. Quick, it's my broker. <laughs> Tell him to sell. <laughs> it went up 500 million euros in one year. Now it's very hard to plan your business if you don't know what your price of raw materials is going to be. Yes, you can hedge it to some extent but not as a long-term proposition. And if you're interested in uh, Nassim Taleb, the guy who did the Black Swan, he says that volatility itself is a big killer of firms, particularly big firms. So price volatility has gone up. The average price of materials is on the way up. We know there are high prices for energy, and again, quite volatile. So sometimes I role-play me at a meeting of... Uh, the, the uh, directors of a company and say our business depends upon falling prices of raw materials, low energy costs, uh, pretty much we need the consumer to buy it so they need to have good credit or some credit available. What do you propose we do in future? Because all of those conditions have disappeared or have become <coughs> difficult. The consumer particularly is not keen on buying at the moment having been burnt somewhat in the latest financial crisis, the six-year Great Recession. Anyway, so you'll be familiar with the idea that we've come to an end of a linear economy, or getting near to it. We need a better plan. And thanks to people like McDonough and Braungart, we had the idea of splitting up our materials into two forms. The biological cycle on the left, which means it can be made, consumed, and put back into uh, the soils. It's um, a clean, not contaminated biological route. And for the other materials, technical ones, we don't want them back in the biosphere is the idea. We want them to cycle a little bit apart from the biosphere in as high a quality and with the most embedded energy as possible. So it's make, use and return it to the technical cycle. It's fairly straightforward, but it's harder to do in practice, but we will bring you some good news, I hope. Now, let's look at it in a more detail. Here's where we might be now. <coughs> Manufacturing, mining, products, the consumer. We put things in landfill, 
and uh, recover some energy. Now, on the right-hand side are technical neutrons. These are the things we don't want ever to be in landfill. And you'll notice there are a series of cycles or loops on the right-hand side. As I will describe in a moment, these are where the added value will come, according to our report. In the uh, making a consumer into a user, and the most shocking realisation is that there's a great deal to be had, a great deal of income to be had by not letting the consumer get a hold of your product. Now, it's access they want. You don't want to lose hold of those materials. Imagine it's a washing machine. You want to keep that close to yourself because that's very valuable. The longer you can keep it in service, providing just what the user wants, the more profit you can make. So you might not want to be thinking of selling some types of product so much as allowing access to them. We'll come back to that. On the left-hand side is the biological cycle. The loops are there just the same as they are on the right-hand side, but they're not elaborated in this uh, collection here. But it's the idea of cascading materials. Let's not go from a tree and then burn it and get some energy. Let's go from the tree to structural timber, to engineered wood, to chipboard, and eventually, yes, you might burn it, but you would probably return the ashes, symbolically at least, to the forest it came from. So there's the idea that it can go through the biological cycle on the left, but again, cascading materials or keeping them in good quality for appropriate periods of time is pretty important. So we asked McKinsey these three questions. That's the basics of it. Nobody had ever asked, would it work at a macro level? Would a more cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach or a circular economy work? <coughs> and we were prepared because we were, we were paying for this for a shock because we, nobody knew. I remember talking to Ellen and saying, what if it comes out with everything that we don't want to hear? <laughs> well, we learned something. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, quite a lot of money later. <laughs> so what they did, they analyzed selected product markets in detail. This is to answer the question, uh, can it decouple resources and growth? So looking at the first one, here's where we've got at the moment with uh, the, 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 the direction of materials. And here's a slightly improved, a slightly improved circular design. And you will notice that recycling hasn't gone up much. Notice 9 to 10. This is an important point. Because some people say, oh, circular economy just means more recycling. Circular? Cycle? Yeah, must be that. But no. Recycling, as many people know, is great for some products. But for others, it's just mincing it up and putting it in like a new raw material. Everything that was quality, everything that was invested in that product has just been destroyed. And in fact, here, maintenance, reuse, remanufacture, all feature very, very heavily in even just a small transition. It's about capturing value before you get to recycling. Okay? It's not more recycling. There is a little bit, yeah. Always helps. But then again, sometimes you might say, no, it doesn't help. Because sometimes we rush to recycle and we never really investigate the possibilities of additional value from doing something else in between. We found out, or McKinsey found out, didn't I get that sell order through? <laughs> it wouldn't just buy time. If, if we shifted in the way, you, you can see the conditions and parameters in the report. If we're looking at primary material demand, it would actually not just buy time, it would reduce the amount of material consumed to a lower set point. That's despite growth, which is not bad, that's good. Then we had a little look at, if you go back to the questions, you probably can't remember them, neither can I. Is it profitable for business? How could I forget that? Let's look at an example of <laughs> light vehicle commercial refurbishment. 
if you have a refurbishment rate that goes from naught, well, 30% instead of being naught, you can see some of the advantages properly. The profit change, it's a case of big product, so you get $2,000 on it. But the net material savings are very significant indeed. And if you're interested in energy questions, of course, that's where a lot of your energy savings are going to come to if you only need 11% of the materials that you previously used in manufacturing new ones. And again, profit and material savings are significant in all of those examples. Here, in the washing machine one, I'm particularly interested that you save well over half, and as we will look at later, washing machines might be a good target for a rental market. The power of loops. This is where your additional profitability might be coming from. In the inner circle, this is trying to keep things in use. This is maintenance, this is remarketing, it's taking it, cleaning it up a bit, perhaps and putting it straight back out there. It's a, a market that exists, but is usually done by uh, smaller players in the market. You can keep it circling a lot longer, and this means perhaps bringing in refurbishment and repair. We'll come to a good example of that with trucks. So you can keep it going longer. You can make sure it doesn't go down the loops too far. Notice that recycling is way out on the fourth loop. It's out there. You can find different use for it across different industries. All done into a small extent. And this is the bottom right is the more, one of the things that Cradle to Cradle particularly looks at, making sure the materials are clean to move around and not contaminated so that your waste product can be something somebody else really wants. Not something they go, oh, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> but you see, it's, a, it's useful stuff if it's designed in the right way to be a useful product or a useful material. So it's about the design to keep in these loops. And here's where you get your additional profitability from, particularly. Just take this one. People say the poor can't afford good quality products. Well, if you had to buy a very good quality washing machine, perhaps. But say we had a washing machine, and they are designed only, some of them, for two to 3,000 cycles. The average cost per wash is 27 cents, so our report tells us. But if we had a washing machine that had a, 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 a survival time of 10,000 washes or more, the cost per wash would go down to 12 cents. Now, of course, a poor person can't afford the super-duper 10,000 wash machine, but if you put it in as a lease or a rental, including the electricity cost, you can get considerable profitability out of that. The customer gets a better machine. There are less breakdowns. You don't have to make new machines because in the original argument, you have to have several machines to make the 10,000 washes. So you get it cheaper, you save materials, you make more profit, and where does the profit come from? By you, the manufacturer, or whoever is handling it, being able to refit the latest advances in efficiency into the machine to get extra cash flow. Because you've set the rental, therefore lowering your costs is what you need to do. So you will design a better machine. Now this is happening in Holland uh, with a deal with Bosch. Um, some, some architects and designers called Thomas Rao. They're providing, through housing associations, washing machines for a rental at lower cost than buying it over the period of time and lower cost than conventional rentals in this area. So that's an interesting one, but there are huge design improvements notice. You can uh, make more money by designing better, not for obsolescence. Okay, car business. We found out that you could buy back, say it was a, a light van, you could buy a light van back with 100,000 miles on the clock, I don't know what that is in kilometers, 160,000 kilometers, something like that. Take out the engine, drivetrain, everything that might be worn, fit it up again and sell it. You could sell it for half the price, but make three times the profit 
per unit on it. There is that much saving in doing that. Now you might say, well, you'll cannibalize new sales. You'll reduce no new sales. But as Walter Steil points out, most of the goods markets like this in Europe are oversupplied. There's too much stuff flying around anyway. Theatre working at 54%, Renault at 77% of capacity at the moment. They don't need to produce more. They could happily reduce the amount of throughput and get more profit by adopting a mode like this. And they're beginning to experiment with it. So what does it add up to overall? Here's the headline figures. Now this is just a, and that's billion up there by the way. This is what it's worth to Europe with a subset, okay, about 50% of the manufacturing sector with a small transition scenario, an improvement of 12 to 14%, you could get $380 billion equivalent saving per year. If you went further and more advanced circularity, you could have up to $630 billion per year. You don't have to worry about Greece's debts. Pay it off, right? <laughs> a couple of years of this. <laughs> and uh, more importantly, if we're trying to invest for new opportunities, for new growth, for new infrastructure, we're going to need to get the money from somewhere. This might be part of that. Reinvesting in the infrastructure which would enable the circular economy to work even better. What does it mean for jobs? More mixed. Depends where you are, depends what you're making. The big benefit for Europe is that we have a lot of firms in the tertiary or the service sector. That's definitely up. Secondary sector in manufacture, some is up, some is down. And in primary sector, we think it's probably down. But overall, the employment effects are positive for Europe. We only talk about that in a regional way. We don't know what it was like globally. Which is very interesting because job's not a bad idea to have some more jobs. Now, what are the key levers in this? What are the key levers? And they're there, you can read them. I'll bring out a couple of points. In A, it is very much as we say in the, in the you know, or they say in the cradle to cradle world, you've got to make sure it's clean. And it should say modularization, not module. I don't know if that's spelled correctly. But design for disassembly is a big point. This is very interesting if you have a different parameter in the design of products which includes its onward life. It really does help not only your profitability potentially because you're creating products which are worth recovering or materials which are worth recovering. It also helps the overall economy because more people can feed from your so-called waste product. So keep it clean and break it down easily would be the key. The reverse cycle, this is underdeveloped at the model, at the moment in the model. We need to be able to get materials back more effectively. It's quite weak. Business model innovation. In the introduction I heard talk about mushroom packaging from eco vated designs. I was talking to Eden Bear a few days ago and he's very, very happy with where he's getting with it. And he says, interestingly, that he's come at this as a business. You know, he wasn't trying to save the planet or anything, which might be a nice idea if he did, but he said it's just a great idea he wanted to capitalize on. And, um, and so he has done, as we've heard. And he, interestingly though, didn't start off as a business person. He did start off as a scientist. He learned all his business understanding as he went on. And I asked him whether he had to talk about the greenness of it. It's selling on its merits. For some people, some buyers, it, it helps that it's that way. But he's selling it on its merits. And um, enabling conditions, what might those be? Well, Walter Stacher, one of the, the person who invented the term trade, trade actually, a Swiss uh, academic, He said one of the biggest things you can do is shift taxes from people to non-renewables and waste. It's not been around for a while, but then again, he did say it 30 years ago. This is one of the biggest levers, enabling conditions that could happen. Why are we taxing people when people are part of this renewable cycle 
And with people, if you don't use them, they go off a bit. They, you know, they become less able to do the job. They need to be in that loop, working. And um, so why don't we tax the things we don't like, rather than the things we do? So that was just one big thing, but there are others. Now, just, just a little example of, does this meet the alternative? And yes, it does. I won't go through the figures, but it's in the report. Even with growth in efficiency, which is going on at the moment, a circular system would allow better material intensity, be able to save more materials, and make more money. That's with growth. But it's not a new story to some extent. But these are the other things that are happening at the moment to really make it the time to go for it. We've got new resource constraints, three billion new consumers on the horizon in Asia. We are out of easy to access resources. We'll never run out of anything, but it's really difficult to get now. There is, they say there's more copper in the urban landscape than there are than there is in the mines. <laughs> Volatile regions, this is a big worry for a lot of people. Can they get the stuff? The new consumer is a little bit more interested, as we will see, in having access over ownership. Uh, car sharing services, uh, you know, the internet's allowed this. I even think of eBay as a sort of way of renting. You can buy it, try it for a while, sell it. Low transaction costs. Um, it looks like there might well be a need for something for people to invest in. I've had several conversations about the amount of money not doing anything at the moment. So perhaps investing in this direction could be a good idea. Resilience to external shocks. Well, a circular economy protects you. One carpet manufacturer said to me, I know where my raw materials are coming from, coming from the old carpet. I'm almost there with entirely 100% renewables, so I know what my electricity prices will be for the next 25 years. I'm not worried about the competition. Let them worry, because I'm able to increase my resilience to maintain my market share when those other firms will be going, oh no, what's happening in the market for materials and energy? They're more secure. And it helps meet with unemployment challenges. A new technology, we can track everything. Uh, we work with a firm called b and I don't know if you know that one. It's Castorama in France, you know, DIY materials. And jokingly, I said, I suppose you'll have on your hammer a little code, and then if I haven't traded it in after a while, we'll send somebody around asking for the hammer back, because we need products. And uh, they were saying to me, Ewan Sutherland, this is the, the key chap in B&Q, he said, in 25 years, I don't know if I will sell anything like tools. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but why would I sell them? I can let people have access to them, make sure it comes to their door and back again, so why do I need to sell them? They want the use of it. They don't want the, unless you collect power drills. You know, come and see my power drills. Come and see my collection of washing machines. All you want is a tool that does what you want. And do you know how long the average power tool is used for in its life? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. You know, continuous. Well, you know, if you add up all the little times you use it, 30 minutes. So every street is full of languishing power tools, lonely for lack of use and then going rusty and not working, why not just, when you order your shopping, I'll have a town power tool for the weekend. Well, some people can find more interesting things to do, but uh, you might want that, okay? Might be a good idea. You don't really want to own it, do you? Here's Michelin, they're not selling tires to the US military, they're renting them by the kilometer. The fully maintenance contract, hundreds of thousands of tires are not sold, but leased. Caterpillar, remanufacturing their engines. 70,000 tons worth of engines are remanufactured every year. Same warranty, same performance, much more profit. So it's happening in a way. Of course, that meant some redesign for the engines to help get them apart. Renault, that's their electric range. They have now a dedicated factory at Choisy for remanufacturing and recovery of materials. And the stuff that comes out the end says guaranteed Renault parts, just as it does from the other factory. Actually, we, we have one of these on the left. They're really for good fun. You know? <laughs> Everybody thought, oh, but drive one, it's great. 
Ellen gets in it with two dogs. I'm not sure that's really the <laughs> Rico, the copier people, they have, a man who, they have a plant in uh, Telford in Britain with 600 people refurbishing this. That's all they do, refurbishing and selling. Again, very profitable. If you think the consumer's not interested, look at this. O2 announces the first smartphone leasing program for UK customers. You don't own it, but who cares? You still use it. Recovery of mobile phones, it's happening a little bit. Well, about 100,000 phones every month. And uh, I usually do this little trick with a plastic bag that dissolves. You've seen those things. And then you drink it. But I got rather tired of drinking plastic bags just to show off. <laughs> <laughs> you have to take my word, I'm not doing it today. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention that, Alan. Uh, we do a lot of education work. We're an educational charity, actually, in case you thought we were some sort of business consultancy. But we do a lot of work with um, schools in Britain and elsewhere now. And uh, we recently had a, this is the, don't they always take that picture? You know, like local papers or something? Jump in the, up in the air, kids. This is a shadow board for B&Q. They, they worked with and under the top board, you know, the board of directors in different functions, met or spoke every month and met twice, three times a year and they came up with a new plan for B&Q. And um, unsurprisingly, it features a lot of circular product stuff. But the interesting thing is they wouldn't let the journalists from Retail Week into the presentation, which I thought was quite good because there must have been some good ideas or they were so bad that, <laughs> hey, we don't know. But the firms are really interested in what these young people who are energized by the idea can, can get a hold of. And uh, that's very pleasing to us. And that's a, the thing I like to end on. When you talk to young people about this sort of thing, when you talk to businesses, it's not a guilt business anymore. It's not a, what can you do to save resources? It's, wow, different design, different opportunities. I can make money this way. It might be a cool job. And that is really, really helpful. Most things get done through enthusiasm, not through guilt. Mm -hmm. that right? And so this is certainly exciting a number of people in that direction. We do some, well, lots of them actually, resources. Here's just some print guides to the resources. D&T, science, we're very interested in all of that. And uh, this is where you can steal everything we have. <laughs> and set up for stealing. And uh, there we are. Uh, I've got to stop there. I don't know what the time is, but that's where I come to the end. Well, we're a bit ahead of time. And okay. Yep. <laughs> Four minutes. Yeah, we, Four minutes. Well, you did really good. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna um, maybe uh, can we uh, ask you some questions well, from the audience? Uh, so help yourself. <laughs> so Ken, uh, you work with Ellen. Oh Rogers. yeah, I should say I'm the head of innovation. That's an interesting uh, yeah. term. Uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I was in at the beginning, and um, my background is in um, business and economics education. I'm a honorary teaching fellow at the School of Management in Brent. So that's a bit about me. I should have said that to start with. But it's your questions that matter. Yeah, I, I would just also like to share that, uh, you know, Ellen Maratha is a, is, a, is a really known person in uh, In, in Britain, Britain, anyway, yeah. Uh, but not so well known in Denmark. Yeah. But she sailed around the world uh, solo. Yeah, she held the record for that in 2005, I think, or six. And then she, when she returned, she found that, uh, that she had a far night boat, not a lot of resources on a boat for her. Yeah, she got to reflecting on the state of resources in yeah. the world and then did a lot of research and thought, well, this is something I'm really interested in. And what she turned her mind most was she was tired of doing talks where people would ask her about environment and things, and all she had to say was, try and do with less or take mm -hmm. care how you go. Yeah. She thought there must be a positive way of looking at the economy. Yeah. So she found out the people that could talk to her about that, and uh, I was one of those. But I do it from an educational point of view for the same reason. I was tired of the sort of, you know, mind how you go message. It wasn't going down very well with students. <laughs> so then, and, and, so uh, this is your chance to ask Ken a question, I guess, and yeah. learn a little. Uh, well, um, share, <laughs> a little, share a little. Yeah. Can you please stand up and uh, say your name? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Um, Monsieur Ebony, uh, conflict in, uh, in moral or ethics between uh, leasing and owning? 
You're leaving control in the hands of other people for your product. Uh, now, I don't understand why there'd be a problem. Myself, do you? Do you help me with that? Yes, it's just because a lot of people buy stuff because they, they like to own it. Yeah, oh, that, 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 that idea. Yes, they do. But in a world full of abundance, particularly with the younger age groups, I think my parents grew up and if they had a carpet, wow, <laughs> you know, I've got to keep that carpet, it's mine, I have a washing machine, it's mine. <laughs> now you go, on eBay I can, get, I can get anything for very cheap, you know? I think there's so much stuff around now that we're becoming less attached to it in a general sense. The way, the way my friend's children treat their smartphones and laptops, you know, it's like, well, if it busts, I can get another one. You know, even if it's second hand from me, but I can get one. Uh, so I think it's changing, but you're quite right. There is a big addiction. We're not all going to suddenly go and rent things, but what people really love is just the same service, the quality of access. You know, they want a great running kitchen. I don't know whether they really love microwaves uh, uh, <laughs> as an object. They just want to know it's going to work for them in the way that they want to look right and perform right. And they can ring somebody up, come and fix this, and it won't cost them anything. Because it's on a because there are people now selling the idea of renting the whole kitchen to you. And in fact, in Holland, one public building by Thomas Rau, for 20 years, all of the fixtures, fittings, lighting, all the services are entirely rented for one monthly fee. And that makes, saves money for the council and makes money for the people putting it in, like Philips. So it's beginning to get there, the idea you want good access to good quality stuff you can rely on rather than owning it. That was a, sorry, a long reply to an interesting question. Thank you. Hi. My name is Nicola. I'm from the Social Media Resource Institute. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what will uh, enable this uh, development of land use movement. Is it only, you talk a lot about these businesses that have to realize that this is the way forward, but maybe politicians and consumers and users? Yeah, it's, if it isn't compelling to the user or the customer, I'm not suggesting we push it. No, it's got to be a better solution. So that's down to the business case, making that case for that. Uh, I think firms will increasingly not want to lose hold of their materials, as I said, because they're very valuable. You know, what does a ton of kind of copper cost? Why would you want all of these washing machines to go out of your door and then you're going to go, can we get any copper anywhere? You know, without knowing how they're going to get it back. In fact, National Grid, who we work with, are building an entire factory to disassemble some of their stuff so they can get these metals. You know, it's becoming much more, and the next step in that is, we will rent you the use of that metal for a number of years. Now, if you're in the financial area, that's an interesting one, because you put bank on that if the prices are going up, you can use that for security. We actually had a lot of problems, or we do have at the moment a lot of problems in Denmark with uh, the wires above the railways get cut down yeah. and get stolen they because there's cover in them, yeah. and they're that valuable already yeah. for, for getting well, stolen. It's true. So that, I don't think renting will necessarily help with that one. Yeah. Yeah. It'll come, I think, it'll come in key product areas, but it's very, very particular on what it is and where and why, and the detail is quite, quite difficult at the moment. We have time for one more question, if there's any. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dan, I'm from uh, the University of Oz, yeah. I'm a PhD on server company in agriculture. Uh -huh. um, maybe a little awkward subject, but uh, yeah. one of the most linear systems we have is the sewage system. So how should you perspective on trying to bring that system, that circularity, circularity into it? Yeah, what's in, our, what's in our service system? Yeah, Lots of valuable yeah. stuff. Yeah. Lots of valuable <coughs> but And contaminants too. Contaminants. Contaminants too. Um, so very sorry, can I just want to make sure that the sewer is, we're talking about cloaca. Don't. That's the tip name of the ship. Continue with that one. <laughs> People are exploring many, many routes with that one from energy recovery, anaerobic digestion, and stuff like that. Anaerobic digestion and dealing with fungi seem to be two of the key uh, industries of the future, by the way. You know, get in with the decomposers because uh, making a material that 
facilities have got to less use into more use can usefully generate some energy as well without, without just burning it. But the, the problem is the design of the system, as you know, it's a very much a throughput, streamlined system. But it, if we are facing the sort of phosphorus shortages we're likely to be facing in the reasonably near future, people already in Sweden have separating toilets sometimes, they're experimenting with that. Gentlemen will have to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> or if it's an institution like this, you could have a special. So the recovery of phosphorus particularly is likely to, to prompt some changes there, but I think this is going to be very slow, slow business. Um, so I don't think there's any good news on the horizon just with that, except for some energy recovery, because it's so contaminated, a lot of it. It's really hard to get the metals out. But that's a function of a bad design to start with. It could be done much more localized and effectively. But I, just, I see that's a long way on. Great question, thank you. So thank you very yeah. much, everyone. Um, I'm sorry it had to be in English, but if you want to know any more, to drop me a line. I'm Ken Webster at alnicofoundation.org. I'm happy to answer or get one of our team to answer anything you might have questions about. <coughs> okay. And you'll be sticking around? I'm staying around till, well, I'm staying around till tomorrow, but I'll certainly <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping you, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't expect to be locked up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks uh, very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.